Welcome guys to another session um, and today we are talking about the HPM memory advances. Now I have covered HPM memory in one of my previous episodes but today we are talking about uh, a wider view of the field and how um, HPM memory is making big waves in the memory industry and in the various chip opportunities. So um, let's quickly look at the internals to refresh our memory on what this uh, new kind of memory is. And its structure essentially consists of a bunch of um, DRAM dies stacked on top of each other. And then there is a PHY die, which is also part of this HPM system. And then all of this is sitting on top of an interposer. And the interposer is connected to another silicon, piece of silicon that's right next to it. So, um, and all this is packaged within um, a, a packet substrate. And so it, essentially it looks like a single chip. Um, this whole, um, you know, the set of dies, logic die and the silicon for the GPU, CPU or SOC, they all look like a single chip. And that's the advantage um, of this, that it's so um, efficient and located in a very small space. So another thing to look at is one of the claim to fame for HBM is that it takes um, a whole bunch of interface bits running at much lower speeds as compared to the other ideas like GDDR5, which use a lot more um, chips and run at very low interface bits. Um, so here what happens is that each of the stacks uh, of the die, um, each of the, sorry, dies in the stack consists of 228 bit channels, right? There's two channels. And I'm talking currently with respect to um, HPM2 or 2E, but I think the number of channels have improved. But the general idea is the same, that there are 228 bit channels in HPM2, and then each channel can be further broken into two pseudo channels, so 64-bit pseudo channel and a 64-bit pseudo channel, it's possible to do that. And so the main advantage here is that, first of all, there is this high pinout interface and each stack layer has two channels, which are, you know, a certain width, 128-bit, and then they can be further broken. The, the thing is that these two are completely independent with address and control bits separate between these two channels. But when you talk about pseudo channels, when you break a channel into two 64-bit pseudo channels, then they share the address and control. So it's not as effective, but it's still effective. Um, and you may be able to overlap some of the um, activities so that you gain more efficiency. So that is the internals of the HPM. Now let's move forward into the advantages. So um, one of the first advantage that you can see right away is that the structure of the column commands read write and the row commands to pre-charge or activate, right? The ones that are the commands that are used for column and the commands that are used for rows, they are separated rather than being multiplexed for DDR. The separation of the um, column and row commands makes it um, a lot more efficient um, and decoupled. The second thing is that the pseudo channel also improves the efficiency and sharing the channels row and column buses while executing commands individually. We already talked about that. The benefits of increasing number of channels is the way, it, this way is increased overall effective bandwidth by avoiding restrictive timing parameters like four access window, which allows more banks activations per unit time. So the fact that we have um, channels and pseudo channels improves our ability to engage more banks um, all at the same time. And then this uh, visual is very useful to kind of understand that to get one terabyte per second bandwidth, you would need 40 each of DDR4 3200 modules, 160 of DDR4 3200 um, each chip right, the discrete components. But when you come to HBM, you need four each uh, HBM2 in a single 50 mm by 50 mm 
package. And the size is just compared here to an addable, right? So the total amount of space is so uh, much more efficient. And the fact that you don't have to route all these signals on your PCBs, uh, and it may all just be within an ASIC or a GPU or a SOC, that is just unbelievable advantage. <clears throat> now you might be asking, is there any downside to HPM? And the fact that the HPM comes in a limited density right now is one of the disadvantages, but we'll check it out in the next slide. So now we're talking about the advances in terms of um, what are the major um, evolutionary advantages in HBM itself. And now here you can see that the HBM obviously is going lower power um, from 1.2 to now it's going to 1.1 in the next generation. Other thing is the number of layers is constantly increasing. It's going up to 16 layers in third generation. Capacity per die has been on the rise and total capacity. Look at the amount of memory. I mean, today, if you go out, you probably see like 16 GB um, total memory associated with HPM. That's common for four high stacks, etc. But it could go up as high as 64 gigabytes, which is pretty nice. Um, another visual to show you how all this is happening is the advances in IO speeds, because we mentioned there's like 1024 IOs in any of these standards, but the speed of these IOs is constantly on the rise. It used to be two, now it's in the current generation is 3.6, it's gonna go 5.2 and 8.4. So when you look at those same 1024 pins in all of these generations, the total bandwidth is on the rise. And it, you know, as soon as we get to HBM3 and we get to 8.4 gigabits per second, um, you are reaching a terabyte per second um, um, bandwidth. And we already saw in the previous slide that you know we needed just four um, dies, uh, four four HBM stacks, and uh, that was like four Advils on your board, right? So how small is that, and how efficient that is? So um, it's obviously pretty efficient in terms of bandwidth, but also HBM promises the better latency. And there's some papers out there that show that HBM's latency has been less than DDR4 and DDR3. Um, it's a little higher than HMC, but it's better than DDR4 and DDR3, and I'll leave references for you guys to look at this paper. Um, overall, then, the the net net summary of this is that the previous memory bound problems, because we have provided so much extra bandwidth and reduced latency, the problems of memory are no longer the problems of memory, they have become compute problems. And the architects can focus now on improving the um, CPI of the processor rather than focusing on how to get more memory. So um, that's it for this episode, and hopefully you guys liked it. If you did, give me a thumbs up or comment and subscribe to my channel, and I'll see you in another video. Thanks a lot, and bye-bye.